and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalie Richardson. I'm the Managing Director at Save Your Skin Foundation. I welcome you to today's webinar presentation titled Basal Cell Carcinoma, What Patients Need to Know. Over 80,000 new cases of skin cancer are diagnosed in Canada every year. That is more than breast, lung, prostate, and colon cancers combined. There are several types of skin cancer, including basal cell carcinoma, or BCC, squamous cell carcinoma, SCC, Merkel cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common of these, affecting thousands of Canadians every day. It is rare but possible for BCC to metastasize or spread to internal lymph nodes and organs. Joining us today to tell us all about BCC and treatments for it is Dr. Max Sauter. Dr. Sauter is a board-certified board certified dermatologist in Canada and the United States with additional fellowship training in cutaneous oncology. He is a former faculty member of Harvard Medical School where he focused on skin toxicities of anti-cancer treatments. He is currently an oncodermatologist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, Ontario, where he assists in the management of complex cutaneous malignancies. We'll get started on his presentation in a moment, but first a few logistics. All participants in the audience for today's webinar will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. You will see at the right-hand side of your screen an option to type in a question. Please feel free to ask your questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to answer them in the last segment. If there are any questions that do not get an immediate answer, we will contact you with a reply and any discussion you wish to have after the webinar. This session will be recorded and will be available for viewing on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us. We will now begin the presentation. Dr. Sauter, we're honored to have you here today. It's a pleasure to work with you. I am so happy our paths crossed two years ago, actually quite literally at the Princess Margaret Walk in Toronto. And uh, I'm happy we now have the opportunity to do this. Uh, without further ado, I will hand you the stage. Um, I really look forward to hearing your talk. So I'm just gonna That's switch great. the screen over to you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And you're absolutely correct. Our paths did literally cross last uh, two years ago at uh, the Princess Margaret One Walk, which is uh, now the walk to conquer cancer. Um, but uh, yeah, so you did a wonderful introduction, actually uh, hitting a lot of the statistics on basal cell carcinoma that I'm going to hit. Um, and so, as you said, uh, I work at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Uh, there, I focus on skin toxicities of melanoma or squamous cell carcinoma treatments, but also local regional management of uh, various different skin cancers. Uh, I also have a private practice where I work at the Toronto Dermatology Center. I have a specific pigmented lesion clinic that uses artificial intelligence to track people's moles, which is what I was just doing prior to uh, the presentation and I also do some clinical research there as well but we're not here to talk about that we are here to talk about basal cell carcinoma and so what I'm gonna take you through in the next hour uh, or hopefully under uh, is the limited epidemiology that we have some key risk factors to consider I'm going to show you a lot of pictures uh, with regards to the clinical presentation of basal cell carcinoma um, and then go over some diagnostic methods and techniques that we use and then take you through the treatment options that are available for all of these. Um, so, you know, cancer is on the rise and, and Canada, uh, when you look at the um, 185 plus countries uh, that do have cancer registries, it, Canada comes at least in 2018 as, as number 11 in terms of global incidence per 100,000 population. And this number, um, as you hinted, is probably underrepresented, mainly because our registries do not track basal cell carcinoma or uh, generally squamous cell carcinomas that are treated outside of cancer centers. And um, so in 2019, we estimated that there were approximately 220 thousand Canadians that were diagnosed with cancer um, and basically one in two Canadians will develop cancer in in their lifetime but these statistics 
are underrepresenting skin cancer. And when we say skin cancer, what exactly do we mean? Um, so as we went over earlier, skin cancer can broadly be defined as melanoma, which is one of the most deadliest types of skin cancer, or non-melanoma skin cancers, okay? And non-melanoma skin cancers actually have quite a few different types. There's basal cell carcinoma, BCC, squamous cell carcinoma, SCC, Merkel cell carcinoma, MCC. But then there are other rare ones, such as cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, also known as mycosis fungoides, um, Kaposi's sarcoma, microcystic adnexal carcinoma, or other skin and soft tissue sarcomas that are even rarer. But out of all of these, basal cell carcinoma is by far the most common one. Some estimates uh, pin this at about 80%. Uh, historically, you know, the two big ones were basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and previously, it was about a four to one. So for every four basal cells, there was a, a one squamous cell carcinoma in terms of ratios. But more and more recent studies are showing that those numbers are actually coming closer and closer in line for a variety of reasons. So the number is probably closer to two to one basal to squamous cell carcinomas. Now within basal cell carcinoma, there are various different subtypes and the subtypes can make a difference in terms of prognosis and treatment. But the two most common are nodular and superficial. And then I'm gonna take you through some of the clinical images and uh, some of the reasons for focusing on uh, some of the other subtypes uh, further on in the presentation. So we don't have really good statistics with regards to non-melanoma skin cancer uh, for the main reason of these are not tracked in cancer registries. They're not tracked in cancer registries because they're so common that they are managed within um, primary care physicians' offices as well as dermatologists' offices and plastic surgeon or general surgeons' offices. Um, to give you an example, today in my clinic, I probably treated about half a dozen basal cell carcinomas. Um, now, in 2014, the Canadian Cancer Society that puts out this annual report in Canada um, did a special focus on skin cancers, and their estimate at that time uh, was approximately 76,000 cases of non-melanoma skin cancer in Canada. Um, now, this number is still probably underrepresented because really when you're looking at tracking cases of non-melanoma skin cancer, you're just tracking um, if a patient got it once. If they got it more than once, they're still counted as one. And to go back to you know, my clinic practice today, out of the six people that I um, diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma today, um, probably about five of them, this was their second or more uh, basal cell. Uh, so they would not, those new cases, even though they were completely different tumors, those new cases would not be uh, tracked in this number. And this number, about 80,000 cases, um, as Natalie stated, basically are more cases of cancer than the four big cancers combined. Um, now, thankfully, they don't result in too many mortalities, um, but they can certainly lead to, to deaths if, if left unattended and neglected. And so why do we really bother treating um, basal cell carcinomas? Well, thankfully, most of them progress quite indolently um, through to local invasion, but they can be very locally destructive. Um, and a very small set will develop into locally advanced disease, such as perineural involvement, um, or going into other structures beyond uh, the skin, which I'll show you some examples later on. And then even rarer do they metastasize um, beyond the actual local growth. And again, numbers are very, very sparse in this, but the estimate is somewhere around 0.002 to 0.005% of tumors will metastasize to possibly lymph node, bone, lungs, or skin. And generally speaking, these are slow growing lesions um, that if caught early can be treated quite easily, um, but the ones that do develop locally advanced or even metastatic um, generally 
may have been neglected. So this is an example of one of my patients that I saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, she's an 87 year old female that had a sore on her back that has not healed in two and a half or three years. Um, and it's never really been investigated. And so uh, this was biopsied and came back as basal cell carcinoma. It's about a five centimeter. Um, this whole area is about a five centimeter tumor um, that basically just needs to be cut out. Uh, the rash around the outside is just a reaction to a bandage that she was uh, putting on. So just to review some basic skin anatomy, we've got uh, three layers of the skin, the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, the dermis, the middlemost layer that includes hair follicles and sweat glands, and then the subcutaneous layer, so the fat. Um, and within the epidermis, you have the basal layer. So that's the layer of cells that is right in between the two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. Um, and that is filled with basal cells. And then one in every 10 cells approximately is a melanocyte, which is the pigment producing cells. And the melanocytes have um, these kind of, uh, kind of tentacle like arms that spread and attach to keratinocytes just above the basal layer. And the keratinocytes are also known as squamous cells. And so when everything's working perfectly and, and the cells look normal, these are melanocytes, basal cells, and squamous cells. Now, when one single one of these goes bad and starts replicating itself, squamous cells that turn bad turn into squamous cell carcinoma basal cells that turn bad turn into basal cell carcinoma, and melanocytes that turn bad turn into melanoma, okay? And so why do people get basal cell carcinomas? Uh, well, there's a variety of risk factors. There's, uh, you know, generally the pigmentary phenotype, also known as, you know, the, the skin characteristics of, of the individual. So we know that people with fair skin, people that always burn and never tan, people with significant freckling and people with red hair have a significantly increased risk of basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma um, over individuals that are darker skin. Not to say that it's not that, that darker skinned individuals cannot have basal cell or squamous cell, um, but it's more of a risk factor. Now, um, What's really interesting is the environmental exposure. So we know that exposure to UV light, ultraviolet light, especially tanning beds, and sometimes medical um, treatments like uh, PUVA, which is uh, UVA, uh, Sorlin plus UVA treatment for psoriasis, can lead to squamous cell or basal cell carcinoma. Um, and generally, the indoor tanning beds is a big reason why we are seeing a big increase in basal cell carcinomas in younger individuals um, in their 20s or, or 30s. Because when you look at the difference between squamous cell and basal cell, in terms of total ultraviolet exposure, um, basal cells, you're really looking at intermittent high intensity exposure uh, to develop a basal cell carcinoma. So for that, you're looking at about 10,000 hours of intermittent high intensity UV exposure. So whether there's a history of blistering sunburns when they were older, uh, recurrent history of sunburns, that's something that, that can increase your predisposition for basal cells. Um, whereas squamous cells, you're looking at total cumulative lifetime sun exposure. So these individuals may not have had significant sunburns or significant tanning bed exposure, but just had uh, chronic overall sun exposure. There's also uh, some chemicals like arsenic that can lead to squamous cell, definitely sometimes basal cell. And then rarer things such as genetic syndromes can predispose individuals to basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. And I've kind of left this out of the talk, um, but you know the most famous genetic syndrome to lead to basal cell carcinoma is nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Um, and these individuals um, can get hundreds of basal cells throughout their lifetime, starting as early as in their teens. And their basal cells look slightly different than the general basal cells that I'm gonna show you shortly. 
Um, anytime you have a chronic wound or chronic inflammatory lesions, that can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and historically, nevus sebaceous, which um, is a congenital um, uh, tumor that is generally thought to be benign, can, uh, was thought to develop into basal cell carcinoma. However, more recent review of the literature um, seems to indicate that uh, these lesions uh, develop trichoblastomas that can often be confused pathologically with basal cell carcinomas. And trichoblastomas are benign. Uh, okay. And then immunosuppression can lead to basal cells and squamous cells. So certainly people with organ transplantation, high risk for squamous cell carcinoma, but also elevated risk for basal cell. Not as great, but still significantly greater than someone who does not have an organ transplantation. So how do basal cell carcinomas look? Well, nodular basal cell carcinomas are probably the most common subtype of basal cell carcinoma. And these present as pink, pearly papules with arborizing telangiectasia. So that's branch-like blood vessels that are throughout them. And I'm gonna show you some other good uh, examples of that arborizing telangiectasia. They generally um, favor the head and neck in terms of their development. So this is on the left cheek of an individual. Here's a very similar one with slightly rolled borders, pink, and then there's a central ulceration. Um, so these were previously also called rodent ulcers because if you leave them over time, they develop a sore in the middle of it, just like a rodent burrowing through the skin. And then here's another one, some good branch-like vessels. This is on the right cheek. Again, young, light-skinned, fair, uh, light-eyed individual. This is one just in front of the ear, quite extensive. Um, so you can see a rolled border and then certainly ulcerations. And it's actually going into um, the ocular canal. Uh, so this would be quite challenging from a treatment perspective. The next most common subtype is superficial basal cell carcinomas. And uh, sometimes these can be confused for squamous cell carcinomas in situ, meaning pre-squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, confused for inflammatory lesions like rashes such as psoriasis. These are usually very well-defined. They're very thin, um, but slightly elevated patch with scale. Often you do get some central clearing in it, and they may have that thin rolled border. This one tends to occur more on the trunk rather than the head and neck region. And this is another example of a back patient with, this is a nodular basal cell carcinoma, but these are superficial basal cell carcinomas here. And this individual may have been exposed to radiation or may have basal cell nevoid syndrome. Here's another classic looking one, ignore the blue. The blue is just uh, surgical markers, but uh, you know, very well-defined red, slightly scaly, thin um, pla uh, plaque that's on the, the right lower back. The next type, which tends to be a little more difficult to treat, um, is the morpheiform, also known as sclerosing basal cell carcinoma. And sometimes this can just look like a scar. Um, it generally has a poorly defined border clinically, uh, which also results in potential difficult histological clearance, which I'll go over. There is somewhat of a shiny surface, and sometimes you can have these little tiny nodules within it. This one tends to occur on the head and neck. Now, sometimes patients come to me and it looks like they've already been treated. So this looks like a scar that I would expect from someone who years ago had um, potentially a basal cell that was treated with electrodesiccation and curatage, which I'll go over later on in the presentation. Um, however, this individual may say, no, 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 I never had anything treated there. Um, or it was treated, but also if you look at around between six and seven o'clock here, right around here, there's a tiny little bit of uh, pink pearliness to it and maybe a tiny little micro ulcer there. 
And so this is a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma, and, and it involves really the whole area here. Similarly, this looks like a scar-like lesion. If you told me that this patient had radiation in the area, I could also think that it was sclerosis from uh, radiation therapy, but there was no preceding history with that. Um, and so this is a morpheiform uh, basal cell carcinoma on the right jaw. Um, there's another type called fibroepithelial, also known as fibroepithelioma of Pincus, named after Dr. Pincus. Um, these tend to be skin colored to pink, um, and they can often be confused with skin tags or irritated skin tags. They're often on a little bit of a stalk, that's what's called pedunculated, um, and they, have, uh, they do favor the trunk. And these are uh, quite good acting actor uh, basal cells. It looks like it may be aggressive, but it's actually uh, treated very nicely and, and low risk of recurrence with this one. There's pigmented basal cell carcinomas. So, you know, I know that people on this call are very familiar with melanoma, Save Your Skin Foundation, you know, that was their primary disease site and, and do wonderful work with melanoma, but also squamous cell carcinoma and Merkel cell carcinoma. This looks like a potential nasty, ulcerated, nodular melanoma. But thankfully, it's actually a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Uh, some of the clues here are that it has this rolled border. Uh, the hemorrhagic crust and scale, that can go with both ulcerated melanoma or basal cell. Um, but this kind of translucent black uh, coloration is, is more characteristic of basal cell, whereas melanoma is just a deep, dark black. Um, but certainly when I see things like this, I always worry, am I, am I looking at a nodular, basal, uh, nodular melanoma versus a pigmented basal cell carcinoma? And here's an example even further. This one looks even more like a, a, a melanoma. Um, but thankfully is, is just a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. There's the infiltrative type that really is just kind of poorly defined, um, indurated, possibly depressed, crusted, eroded, ulcerative uh, papules and, and plaques. Um, and these wounds look like they're just sores, but they will never heal because they're all basal cell carcinoma. And then there's another good actor, the infundibulocystic, uh, which is just a very well-defined pink pearly papule, generally not ulcerative, um, generally on the head and neck, generally in the elderly population. So that's kind of a rundown of, of what we're looking for, but how do we diagnose uh, basal cell carcinoma. And so the standard of care, um, well, I say the standard of care is dermoscopy plus pathology, but um, definitely pathology is the standard of care. And I'm going to go over those two modalities. There are some newer non-invasive modalities um, that generally um, are still more in the um, research phase um, that are, you could think of as um, a non-invasive biopsy. So there's reflectance confocal microscopy or optical coherence uh, tomography. Both of these use either um, sound waves or infrared rays to um, look at the architecture underneath the skin and look at patterns to be able to diagnose basal cells um, and other cutaneous malignancies. But that again is beyond the scope of this talk. So dermoscopy, um, basically any dermatologist in Canada that trained in the last 10 to 15 years should be very familiar with this device. Um, it, it's mandatory to, to learn at this point. These are handheld devices that provide 10 times magnification with peripheral polarized light. And what they do is we can identify specific patterns that allow us to determine if a lesion is definitely benign, definitely malignant, or if there's something in between, or if it's something in between that requires further testing. And so uh, to give you an idea of the power of dermoscopy, um, 
a primary care physician, and these are old statistics, but um, a primary care physician that is looking at moles and sampling moles for either dysplastic nevi or melanoma, one in every 10 of those moles sampled will be either dysplastic nevi, melanoma in situ, or melanoma. It, compare that to a dermatologist, generally one in every six biopsies will be um, either a dysplastic nevus or um, melanoma in situ or melanoma. Now, if you uh, add in dermoscopy, a well, uh, if it's a dermatologist that's well-trained in dermoscopy, then that ratio goes to basically one in every three biopsy um, will have uh, either a precancerous or a cancerous condition. Uh, so it really is another tool um, to help us reduce unnecessary uh, biopsies. And so there are specific patterns of basal cells that can be identified underneath uh, dermoscopy. Um, and so the characteristics that we look for is the arborizing vessels, as I discussed earlier, uh, spoke wheel-like concentric structures, leaf-like areas, large blue ovoid nests or blue-gray globules, shiny white structures, ulcers, scattered vascular pattern, short flangela injectasia. So what do I mean by that? So here's an even clearer example of the arborizing or branch-like blood vessels. So when you see these, generally speaking, it's a basal cell carcinoma. These are spoke wheel-like concentric structures. So you can see that there's a central darkness and then uh, there's spokes radiating from the outside of it. Now, this could look very concerning for melanoma to the untrained eye. Um, however, this is a very specific structure for basal cell carcinoma. Then there's leaf-like patterns. So these look very similar to the concentric uh, spoke-like pattern, uh, but a little less centric, so more acentric, meaning the focus is just off-center. And then it's, uh, it almost looks like a maple leaf structure here. Here's an example, a very nice example, of a large blue-gray ovoid nest. There's also an ulcer in this picture as well. Um, and again, this could be very concerning uh, for melanoma, but thankfully this is one of the features of basal cell carcinoma rather than melanoma. Other features, ulcers, here, here, and here, and then shiny white lines as well. But really, the gold standard for diagnosing um, is pathology. So that's where we actually take a sample and um, look at it under a microscope. And there's various ways of getting samples. So one of the ways is curatage, where we have this loop-like structure uh, tool that uh, has a blade on one side, and you can basically just kind of scoop it out. Now, I tend not to use this for uh, pathology, for biopsy, but some individuals do. I do use this for specific treatments of low-risk basal cell carcinoma. There's shave or saucerization biopsy. So a shave biopsy is cutting tangentially or parallel to the skin um, and really just disrupting the epidermis. Uh, whereas a saucerization biopsy, which is sometimes done for um, dysplastic nevi, is uh, getting a deeper cut. So going into uh, the mid dermis in order to uh, make sure that there's pathologic uh, sampling of the dermis. There's punch biopsy, um, which uses a circular tool. This is the tool here that basically looks like an apple core. So it's a, it's a hollow cylinder with blades on the end. You do a twisting fashion and you get this core, you pull it out, snip it, um, and then you're left with a circular uh, hole, which is generally uh, closed with a single stitch depending on the size of it. Some people for small enough punches uh, 
not even put in a, a stitch and, and it can heal just secondarily. And then there's an incisional biopsy where you're actually uh, using a scalpel, you're cutting down into the fat and then you're um, generally closing it with, with stitches. And whatever way you get tissue, uh, it's basically preserved in formalin, shipped to a laboratory. It's frozen onto um, basically a block of ice. That block of ice is then cut into ultra fine pieces and plated onto uh, a slide. And then that slide is then viewed by a pathologist, another medical doctor, that will look under the microscope to look for classic patterns of basal cell. So classic patterns, generally this is a blue tumor, so it's got basaloid uh, staining on uh, H&E. There's something called retraction artifact, these kind of slit-like clefts um, that are separating the dermis and epidermis. That's characteristic of basal cell. There's peripheral palisading. So you can see that along this edge, it's a lot darker um, than the rest of the tumor. That's called peripheral palisading. And then you also have mucin in the stroma. Stroma, uh, which is uh, in the middle uh, of the tumor. So those are classic features of a basal cell under the microscope. And so all of this we use to put together to identify whether these basal cells are at low risk of recurrence or at high risk of recurrence. And so there are clinical risk factors and there are pathological risk factors. The clinical risk factors, some of the most important ones are the location and size. And so there's low risk areas, which is generally trunk and extremities. There's medium risk areas, um, which generally are the cheeks, forehead, neck, and scalp. And then there's the high risk area, which is the mask area, uh, the central face, eyelids, eyebrows, nose, lips, chin, um, in front of the ears, behind the ears, um, as well as hands, feet, genitalia. So if it's low risk in a low risk area, less than a certain size or greater than a certain size makes it high versus low. Um, clinically, if you look at the tumor and it's got poorly defined borders, you don't know where it starts or stops, that's a high risk feature. Um, and if it's primary or recurrent, primary meaning this is the first time you're treating it, recurrent meaning that um, you've treated it once, it's come back again. Uh, if there was radiation in the site, then that certainly makes it more difficult to treat. If um, and if the patient is immunosuppressed. Those are all clinical factors that I take into consideration when I'm uh, working with the individual to come up with the best treatment plan. When we're looking at the pathology risk factors, you want to make, you want to see if there's perineural invasion that can um, result in greater risk of recurrence as well as uh, potential local invasion. Uh, and then you're looking at the subtype of the basal cell. So nodular and superficial, generally lower risk. Micronodular, infiltrating and sclerosing, very high risk of, of recurrence. Um, and so I put this all together to basically work together in partnership with the person to come up with the best treatment plan for them. And so in terms of the modalities of basal cell carcinoma treatment, you're looking at surgery, rarely cryosurgery, rarely photodynamic th therapy, rarely topical or intralesional therapy, sometimes radiation. And then for locally advanced or metastatic, you're looking at targeted therapies. And then there's some evidence and research on immunotherapies that are that's in the pipeline, some exciting things in immunotherapy. And so I'm gonna go over the different things, uh, the different treatments and what to expect. In terms of surgery, there's simple excision where you would basically look at the tumor, cut it out with approximately a four millimeter margin, um, if you can achieve that in the anatomic location and close it up. Um, and generally speaking, standard excision, that results in about a 90% cure rate or a 10% recurrence rate. There's curatage and electrodesiccation. And I generally, um, generally this is only done on non-hair bearing areas and generally only done for nodular and superficial uh, basal cells. And so basically what you do 
is you take the curette and you very and and you scrape the surface and tumors tend to have a mushy feeling to them uh, whereas normal skin has uh, terminal hair well has uh, hair apparatuses sorry has skin appendages within it and so you would feel grittiness of oil glands or uh, fine hair gland hair follicles um, when when you're scraping across the surface and so you scrape and then you use electrocautery, also known as electrodesiccation, um, to burn the surface. And you scrape it, burn it, scrape it, burn it. You do that three times, um, and that results in a cure rate of over, you know, 92%. If you do curatage alone, sometimes that is uh, satisfactory. Uh, one of my teachers and mentors did a great study out of the University of Ottawa. Um, looking at uh, curatage alone versus curatage and, and electrodesiccation and showed that the results were very similar uh, with a better cosmetic outcome. The gold standard for removal is Mohs surgery. However, there is a limited supply of Mohs surgery in Canada. And so it's really um, reserved for exclusively basal cell carcinoma on the head and neck region with high risk features. So um, whether it's recurrent in the site of irradiation, um, if it's over a certain size, um, or if it has uh, some of those histologic subtypes that are more aggressive. And so what is Mohs surgery? Well, Mohs surgery is essentially the, the sequential removal of the skin cancer until you achieve 100% clearance of the margins. And you do it in real time. And so essentially skin cancer can often have roots that uh, are beyond the visible border. And so it's just a day procedure. The area is numbed and cleansed in the usual fashion. Um, and the Mohs surgeon will go in and will take off the tumor uh, for what they believe uh, is, is what they can see, generally with a very narrow margin. So with about a one millimeter margin. And then, they will um, plate it and they will process it right there and then in the lab and they'll look at it under the microscope. Now the way that they look at this specimen, if you think of um, the tissue as um, a loaf of bread, historically, um, you know, when, you, when, when I send a basal cell to the lab, what they're doing is they're putting that block of tissue in an ice block and then they're cutting uh, slices of bread essentially and they're putting it on a on on the uh, microscope slide and a pathologist is looking at maybe a couple slides from one end a couple slides from the middle and a couple slides from the end and so even if they say that it looks like everything is clear um, it's possible that some of the slices still had tumor extending to the edge. With Mohs surgery, they process it differently. So they actually process it almost like uh, a pie crust. So they will take this whole area here and they'll put it under a microscope so that you're looking at it from the top down. They'll look at it under the microscope and they'll see whether there's any tumor left and maybe they'll see a little tumor left at say four o'clock uh, on the specimen then they'll go back to uh, the patient and they'll take a small little piece out at four o'clock and they'll go and test it again and they'll see if it's clear and they keep on doing this that day um, until there's no more tumor seen underneath the microscope and generally speaking, you know, about 70 to 80% of the time, um, it's the first cut takes it all. Um, but sometimes you need two, three, four, even five stages to, to clear a lesion. Um, but this is all done. So again, again the area is uh, numbed and, and cleansed. The first lesion's cut. A, ba a bandage is put, in, put on over the patient. They're sent to the waiting room. Once the um, slide is reviewed, they're brought back in. If you need to take more, they take more. Put 
bandaged back up, sent back to the waiting room, and you keep on doing that until you have a, a complete clearance. And so with that, the recurrence rate is less than 1% um, for, for primary uh, lesions. For, for secondary uh, recurrence rates, so these are lesions that have been treated already, uh, there's a slightly higher across the board uh, re recurrence rate. So rarely we do cryosurgery. Cryosurgery is using liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees Celsius, also minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and really to treat a basal cell carcinoma, you need to achieve minus, 600, minus 60 degrees Celsius, um, ideally for about a minute for two cycles, uh, which is not the most comfortable thing. Um, and uh, this can create uh, blistering pain, uh, ulceration, um, and it can leave scars um, and especially hypopigmentation. But for patients, especially elderly patients um, who are not really interested uh, in surgical options, sometimes this is um, a good palliative measure to, to help manage uh, small, low-risk uh, basal cell carcinomas. Photodynamic therapy is also approved in Canada for the treatment of superficial basal cell carcinomas. This is a medical device as well as a medication. So the skin is prepared, Metvix, which is methyl uh, amino levulate, uh, is applied. This is a photosensitizing agent. It's left on for three hours incorporated into rapidly dividing cells, such as those in basal cell carcinoma. Uh, the metfix is removed, and then a red light is shone on the area for approximately 20 minutes. This red light activates the medication and basically creates local inflammation um, to eradicate the basal cell carcinoma. There is quite a high recurrence rate with this, but it can um, be a good option for low-risk basal cells that are in cosmetically sensitive areas. Um, so there's virtually no scarring uh, with this type of procedure, provided that it, uh, it manages the tumor. And so this is an example. We also use this treatment for actinic keratoses. Actinic keratoses um, are precancerous lesions that can lead to squamous cell carcinomas. And they're gritty red, uh, air, uh, red papules that have a, a predilection for the head and neck area, any sun exposed sites. And so here are some really thick precancerous lesions. Uh, this was before treatment. So he was treated, this individual, I'm assuming it's a male, was treated immediately after. You see a little bit of redness immediately after, a lot more redness. Seven days later, just kind of an overall pink. And then about 45 days later, dramatic, dramatic improvement in those gritty erythematous papules that were scattered throughout the scalp. Um, looks to me like five to 10 years younger um, because the whole field was treated. But same concept for basal cell carcinoma. In terms of topical treatments, um, there are, uh, so both, 5-fluorouracil, which uh, is a cream, Fudex cream, as well as Amiquimod 5%, also known as Aldera, uh, are approved for superficial basal cell carcinomas. Um, the idea with them, there are two different mechanisms. So 5-fluorouracil um, is an anti-metabolite that's uh, incorporated into rapidly dividing cells. Um, and it basically inhibits the cell from rapidly dividing, creates a lot of irritation and inflammation. Use it twice a day for anywhere from uh, four to eight weeks to try and clear a, a basal cell carcinoma. Imiquimod um, is, uh, was actually one of the first immunotherapies that was uh, available. So uh, this came out in the 90s and it activates toll-like receptor 7. Um, which basically sends out a beacon to the body's immune system to tell the body to, to rev up in that particular area, and then the body's immune system will, will clear the, the, the lesion. 
The initial studies uh, stated to use a Miquelmod twice a day for 12 weeks. However, that's a very, very that can be very, very challenging to do. Newer studies show Monday to Friday for six weeks once a day uh, is probably sufficient to uh, clear superficial basal cell carcinomas. And I've certainly used this um, on, um, it, it's my favored one in terms of treating basal cell carcinoma. Um, and uh, I use it on cosmetically sensitive superficial basal cell carcinomas. I also use it off-label on larger basal cell carcinomas on the uh, trunk. Technically, you shouldn't be using it uh, beyond a basal cell carcinoma that's uh, that's two centimeters or larger, but I, I have used it with good success for some superficial ones that are larger than two centimeters. There are other medications, inginal mebutate, um, also known as Picado, which actually was recently taken off the market in Canada because of the concern of increase of squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and then I really don't use uh, the lower medications on this list, and I don't think many dermatologists do either. And um, this is a typical course for what you can expect with Miquimod or really any field therapy. So very similar to the photodynamic therapy. Now this was using a Miquimod to treat actinic keratoses again. Um, to treat actinic keratoses, you use a Miquimod 3.75% uh, uh, once a day for two weeks, then a two week break, then once a day again for another two weeks. So a baseline, you don't really see much. At the end of the first two weeks, lots of inflammation and irritation, which um, when people come in, you know, they're very sensitive and, and very tender, but I say, this is great. This is exactly the type of reaction that you want. You can see at the end of two weeks, basically everything heals up. You do another two weeks of the treatment, a little few, a lot less inflammation, but still some um, activity. And then at the end of 14 weeks, you see a skin that's smoother, uh, better characteristic than baseline. Very, very rarely do we use intralesional treatments. Um, I do do a lot of intralesional treatments, more for keratoacanthomas. Uh, I also do it for um, uh, for um, satellite melanoma or in transit melanoma within the skin. Um, so 5-fluorouracil uh, can be used. Uh, interleukin-2 is more used in uh, melanoma, but all of these have some evidence, although the evidence is poor with regards to treatment of, of basal cell. So, um, you know, not, not great randomized control trials with these, but some impressive numbers that actually made me consider maybe I should uh, try 5-fluorouracil in some of the larger uh, lesions. If an area, if a patient is not a candidate for um, surgery or topical treatments, radiation can be considered. Radiation uh, leads to nonspecific DNA damage. There's different types of radiation that can be used, um, and uh, it can it can have quite nice clearance of basal cell carcinoma. However, uh, one of the long-term complications can be um, development of squamous cell or precancerous lesions within the radiation field after about 10 plus years. More recently, there's been an explosion of, of targeted therapies. So targeted therapies um, have been developed for many different treatments. Many of you may be familiar with the targeted therapies for melanoma such as the BRAF or MEK inhibitors, um, but there's actually a targeted therapy for basal cell carcinoma. There are two approved in Canada. Um, and essentially, in uh, a significant amount of basal cells, uh, we have improper hedgehog signal signaling. So uh, the hedgehog uh, pathway is regulated by uh, patched uh, molecule that's on the cell surface that inhibits smoothened. And when hedgehog is active, when hedgehog attaches to patch, 
then smoothened becomes activated and then leads to cellular proliferation and cellular replication. Um, so at resting state, patched inhibits smoothen, which is exactly how we want it to be. And then under various conditions, hedgehog will basically release the breaks. And so then the cell will rapidly divide. Now you can get either dysfunctional patch, which then leads to constitutively active smoothen, or you can have constitutively active smoothen with a proper functioning patch. And in Canada, we have two molecules, bismotigib and son sonigigib, um, that can basically inhibit smoothen. And that inhibition leads to the decrease in the cellular proliferation. And so these are known as um, Aravedj or Automozo, and um, they are generally reserved for locally advanced or metastatic basal cell carcinomas. And again, as I showed earlier, they, they suppress the transmembrane pro protein smoothen. With regards to the evidence for them, so vismotigib, you're looking at a response rate of around uh, 33% for uh, metastatic. So about a third of people with metastatic basal cell will respond uh, for about nine and a half months, and then they'll lose response or be unable to tolerate the side effects. Uh, whereas for locally advanced basal cell carcinoma, you're looking at about 47% response rate with a medium response time of, of 7.6 months. Uh, for Sinetigib, you're looking at a response rate very similar. So this was approved based on two separate dosings, 200 milligrams or 400 milligrams. Basically, no one uses 400 milligrams right now, um, but the response rate was very similar. So about 32% for metastatic basal cell carcinoma. Now, there are a lot of adverse events with these that can be limiting to treatments. So especially is muscle spasms, um, which can be very uncomfortable. There is thinning or loss of hair, taste loss, which um, is, is a very um, difficult uh, side effect to, to manage and, and for patients to tolerate. Weight loss, decreased appetite independent of the taste loss, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and then with Sony, uh, you're also looking at some elevated creatinine kinase and, and lipase. So they can work very well um, for those that it works in, um, but there, there's also some side effects that um, can limit the therapeutic uh, duration. And so here are some really, really nice examples of what targeted therapy can do. So this was a 71-year-old female. She had a history of multiple non-melanoma skin cancers. She had local recurrence of the basal cell carcinoma on her nose. You can see her nose was already deformed probably from multiple non-melanoma surgeries. Um, and it was previously treated with both resections and radiation. So she wasn't a great surgical candidate to begin with. She refused any further treatments. The surgery, probably she would have lost her nose um, just because there was probably not much cartilage left here and it looks like there may be some internal involvement as well. Um, and so she was started on Vismotigib and after five months she had a complete response and, and had done very, very nicely on that. Another example, an 83-year-old male. So those of you that don't read radiology, this is the head and neck. If you imagine kind of around the nose, if you cut someone in half, you're looking at the nose here. These are the two orbital, uh, or si sorry, sinuses right here. And on the left cheek, um, you're looking at a tumor that is approximately four, and a half uh, centimeters by 1.5 centimeters. And it looks like it's invading into some bone. Um, it definitely had some other high risk features. And after 19 months on Vismotigib, you're looking at a complete response. So the bone back intact, uh, a little bit of thickening, maybe compared the left versus right, but definitely no evidence uh, radiologically 
uh, of any further basal cell carcinoma. Finally, um, there's immunotherapy. So again, you guys are uh, a well-educated audience, um, and so I know that you know a lot about immunotherapy with regards to the advances and the amazing advances that it's made in uh, melanoma, as well as Merkel cell carcinoma, as well as squamous cell carcinoma. And it's really been a paradigm shift in, in fighting skin cancer, in fighting any cancer, actually. It started in melanoma, but it subsequently gone on to be approved from other uh, treat for other uh, cancers and um, we're seeing amazing durable significant response rates in in melanoma squamous cell carcinoma non-small cell lung cancer to to name a few and there are some early studies showing definite benefit in locally advanced basal cell carcinoma as well as metastatic basal cell carcinoma um, and uh, particularly, the, uh, um, there was recently some data published on uh, simiplumab, also known as Libtio, um, in the setting of locally advanced or metastatic basal cell carcinoma. So that's on the horizon. Nothing's approved yet, but, but something uh, to look forward to in the pipeline for the very rare metastatic or locally advanced basal cell carcinomas. And so with that, I think we're almost at an hour, just under an hour, but uh, I'll end with this. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common cancer, period. Not skin cancer, but cancer. It's so common that we don't have any good statistics that could actually properly quantify basal cell carcinoma. It is a, a preventable, in some cases, condition with safe sun practices and avoiding indoor tanning. And I hope I showed you that there are many, many, many treatments available for these. And what I'd like to leave you with is um, that when caught early for any of these, for melanoma, for squamous cell carcinoma, for basal cell carcinoma, um, it's always much easier to treat them at earlier stages. And so I encourage anyone who's listening to this to seek medical attention if you have any crusty or non-healing sores that have been there generally for more than a month, sometimes longer depending on the comorbidities, but generally a month is a good uh, frame of reference. If you have a small growing lump that's red, pale, or pearly in color that lasts for, again, more than a month, that's something to seek medical attention for. And finally, if you have any new spots, freckles, or any moles that are changing in size, color, shape, or symptoms over a short period of time, weeks to months, that is something certainly to uh, seek medical attention for. Uh, and with that, I thank you all for listening, for putting up with me for an hour. I hope that um, I gave you a good overview of basal cell carcinoma. And uh, with that, uh, Natalie, I'll just I'll open it up to you. I don't know if there are any questions or if you had any questions. Um, I'd yes. be happy to answer anything. No, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. That was an incredible presentation. It's, it, it is definitely encouraging to see uh, that, that patients have so many options, you know, that, that could, could help them with this disease. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I do have a question. Uh, we have time for one question that has come in. If I can pronounce it, um, I give this person kudos for, <laughs> for typing this, so I apologize if I mispronounced this, but um, Dr. Sauter, could you comment on it, intermittent I, uh, itraconazole with hedgehog inhibitors to prevent primary resistance? I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, yeah, so um, that is one of the concerns with these hedgehog inhibitors um, that you, with chronic use, basically the tumor gets smart and goes around the inhibition of, of hedgehog inhibitor uh, or smoothened inhibitor is what I should say. Um, and it's, you know, not a new problem. So in melanoma, it was the same thing. BRAF inhibitors came out. They were wonderful. Um, but, you know, after about nine months, the tumor got smart, went around it. And so now in melanoma, you're seeing combination therapy, BRAF and MEK inhibitors that seem to give us a more durable response. Um, and I think that eventually that will be, uh, I, that, that would be ideal in basal cell. I haven't seen enough evidence on, with regards to intraconazole plus 
um, any of the hedgehog inhibitors. So I can't really comment further, but it's certainly a concern and certainly something um, that would benefit patients if we could figure out um, uh, a treatment that, that could help us go around, uh, get around the, the resistance issue with these drugs. Wow, okay, thank you. Um, one more quick question, or I think it may be a quick question. Um, following, following guidelines, if someone is diagnosed with um, basal cell carcinoma, do you, is there a recommended uh, following procedure or timeline that um, patients and caregivers should consider? Like if someone has a, a one or multiple basal cell carcinomas and then should they be followed by a dermatologist um, and or oncologist for the long run? Yeah, so generally speaking, um, people with basal cell carcinomas do not need to be followed by a medical oncologist. Um, I can only comment on my practice with regards to being followed by a dermatologist. There are no formal guidelines, but generally speaking, in my practice, um, if you're diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma, um, within when you're first diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma, then I generally like to follow you up um, within about th anywhere between three and six months for another full body skin exam to make sure that you're not growing a second one because often once you have one, you're at increased risk of developing a, a second one. Um, again, within my practice, most of these um, are treated within four weeks of diagnosis. Um, the only caveat to that is if a patient does require Mohs surgery. Unfortunately, um, Mohs surgery wait times can be quite long um, and they can also be quite distressing to, to patients. So, you know, even in Toronto where I practice, um, we have uh, four wonderful Mohs surgeons in the city uh, that do amazing, incredible jobs, but they're just so overwhelmed with demand that their wait lists can be anywhere from six to 12 months, um, which can be a lot of time for someone who's living with a sore that's generally on their face that's not healing. Um, but thankfully, as I said before, these tumors are very indolent and slowly grow and, and grow slowly. Um, and so even waiting six to 12 months for Mohs surgery um, is sometimes, is in a lot of times okay. Um, is it ideal? No. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we just, we don't have the access that there is in the US for Mohs surgery. Now, if you flip that in the US, um, there's a whole lot more Mohs surgeons than in Canada. Um, and um, there have been several studies looking at the clinical indications of Mohs surgery for basal cells in Canada versus in the U.S. And in the U.S., they tend to do it on a lot smaller um, and um, a lot less aggressive um, basal cells. Not all the time, but, but in, you know, in, in a large portion of it just because simply there, there's a lot more demand, or sorry, a lot more supply of Mohs surgery. Um, and um, there's probably a happy medium, but, um, but unfortunately in Canada, we do have high wait times for, for Mohs surgery. Okay. Did I answer well, that question or did I go yeah, off on it? Yes. <laughs> nope, that was perfect. Good tangent too, though. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's, okay. it's very interesting. So yes thank you very much okay well i know we have gone over uh time so i in uh, time um thank you again for answering these questions and for giving this presentation um i really uh, we all really appreciate you sharing your insights with us and your time today and in preparation for this session so uh, with that i'll also thank everyone in attendance uh, for attending today's webinar Again, I'll mention that this has been recorded and will be available for viewing on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and YouTube channel in the next day or so. I'll email you. Uh, if there are additional questions that uh, we weren't able to answer, please uh, just send them to myself at natalie at saveyourskin.ca. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Sauter. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This right. was great. Thank you. Have a good uh, rest of your day. We'll chat again soon. Thanks. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks a lot. And this ends the webinar session.